Perfect. Hello, everyone. Hi. Um, welcome, everyone. So this is number six of our Strive in IWD events this week. Um, so this afternoon, we're talking about how to create belonging in the workplace. If you haven't checked out the rest of the webinar schedule this week, please do. Uh, I will add that events link into the chat function shortly. Uh, so just a little bit of housekeeping. This will be recorded and shared after the session. Uh, so if you have any comments or questions as we go, please feel free to use the chat functionality. It can be any time. You don't need to wait until the end. Um, so I'm just about to hand it over to the panelists and they'll chat for about 30 minutes or so. And then we'll have about 15 minutes for Q&A at the end. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Chris. Thank you. Um, hey, everyone who, who's listening. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'll give a, a quick 15, 20 second intro. Um, I'm Chris, um, 20 years experience predominantly within IT, uh, which is how, uh, how and why I know a few of the panel members. Um, recently set up my own business in diversity consulting and advisory um, and across the streams of talent strategy and in the creative side of EV, EVP and EB. Um, yeah, I, I, I live in Sydney, um, and for those of you who, who don't know my business, um, I kept it fairly simple at my surname and co, um, just so that I wouldn't have to pay for a, an alternative domain name. Um, Scottish original background, so I was a little bit stingy in paying for a domain name that I didn't know if it was going anywhere. Um, I, I won't give too much on the panel members. Um, I'll probably let them introduce themselves, and in my view, um, unfortunately, it goes Sarah, Michelle, and then Helen. I don't know about the view of everyone else. But I'll pass over to Sarah first to give a brief intro, um, and then we'll get into the questions. Sounds good. Um, my name's Sarah Blackmore. I am calling from Vancouver, Canada. I'm originally from the UK. Um, I have just under 20 years of experience working in sort of human resources, people and culture type positions. Um, and in the last nine years, I have been specifically spending time working in the tech sector uh, and building building companies using human talent, uh, working with co-founders and executives and coaching high performance teams. So that is what um, that's how I get my kicks. Fantastic. Not sure how I follow that, Sarah, but uh, I'm Michelle Hardy. I'm at uh, Amazon Web Services, where I'm the head of strategy operations and engagement, effectively the COO for our Australia and New Zealand businesses. I'm also the executive sponsor of our Women at Affinity Group. So you might hear a little bit more on what, what they are as part of our Amazon culture um, and have a number of other roles, including a really important role in our recruiting process as well. So thank you so much for having me. Helen? I think I got muted. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Helen Maguire. I'm the co founder and CEO of a business called Diversely, um, which is a platform that helps businesses to order, assess, and improve their uh, diversity data. Um, and representation within their, their company. Um, my background is actually in communications. I'm based over here in, in Dubai, so it's a little bit early for me, as you can probably see. Um, and uh, I started my own businesses back in 2014, 2015, um, mostly based around women um, seeing a real need in the market in the Middle East and Asia for support for women going back into the workforce. Um, so that was my, my first business and, and diversity, my current business, really branched off of that. Um, so yeah, really lovely to be here and looking forward to the conversation. Awesome. Thank you for the introductions. Um, I'm glad I kept mine short and sweet because it was um, superseded by three much better introductions. Um, I'm going to start this off fairly simply. Um, the session is around building belonging in the workforce and the workplace. Um, and I just want to ask each of you very briefly, uh, when we talk about belonging at work um, or, or in general, if you want to give outside of work, what, what does that mean to each of you? Um, or how would you sum it up so that everyone can understand for those who have never been in the crux of building belonging in a workplace? And I'll probably go same direction again, by the way. Um, until there's directed questions, I'll go Sarah, Michelle, Helen. I'll keep this fairly simple. Sorry. Uh, okay, then I'll kick it off. That's fine. Um, for me, uh, belonging, well, when I think about belonging at work specifically, for me personally, belonging is ultimately not having to wear a mask. 
um, and not have to have the emotional burden of trying to be more than the person that you are as a whole. Um, when I think about belonging and building cultures of belonging, though, that changes a little bit because belonging in my world is really a feeling that comes from a series of actions that happen in the workplace. And then belonging is the feeling that accompany those actions or the lack of belonging, in fact, um, is what follows those actions most of the time. Awesome. And I think, guess for me, um, it's, I mean, it's quite a fundamental concept, belonging. So I think as humans, we're actually ultimately hardwired to, to belong to something and connect with other humans. It's just a basic, like if you go back all through the ages of time of how we actually um, evolved as human beings, we started evolving in tribes, and that is that nature of belongingness. Um, and when I started kind of looking into this a little bit more, and Maya Angelou uh, said, as long as I long, sorry, as does every human being to be at home wherever I find myself. So it's wherever I find myself, that's where I belong. And that can apply obviously to home and community and friends and family, equally as it does to the workplace. And, and, and we talked about that basic need. It's part of Maslow's hierarchy of motivation, right? So it sits within it's the third one down. So right at the top is self-actualization, then esteem, and then it's love and belonging, followed by safety and, and physiological needs. So it's it's really fundamental. When we think about in the workplace, that can be um, at the smallest kind of element. It's the team at which you belong to and feel safe in, but it's also starts to get broadened out in terms of maybe that's team within the business unit, within the entire organization and what that really represents. So I think it, it's incredibly important. Um, we belong, we feel a sense of belonging when we are supported and that helps us be more resilient. And ultimately, that actually contributes to higher levels of performance. It's been proven, there's loads of data points, but if you've got a really strong sense of belonging, that's because you're supported and you're resilient and you're actually going to have a much higher performing team. So for me, it's actually, it's fundamental. It, 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 you cannot operate a workplace without it. Now, do we have more to do in everywhere we work? Yes, because I think also as human beings, we're actually divinely discontent at times. So we're always upping our expectations in terms of what that nature of belonging is, but fundamentally important. Awesome. Thank you, Michelle. On to Helen. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, in, in the kind of grand scheme of diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, the B is always at the end, but actually it is one of the most fundamentally important. Um, for me, you know, when I think back in, in my career um, and, and look at how we run things now, it's really about being connected to the people, the purpose and the role um, that you have in, in the workplace, wherever you're working. And I suppose feeling really that um, you and your work and your contribution matter, that they make a difference and that you um, are having an impact and that people are essentially not just seeing and hearing you, but also listening to you. Um, and taking actions off the back of some of the points that you raise or some of the issues that, that you may have. Um, and, and I think being free to be yourself is, is just a super important part of being at work and, uh, you know, wherever you are, whether you're at work or home or, or wherever it may be. Um, and that really is what belonging, that, that's how it chimes with me. It's, it's about being able to bring your whole self to work. We've talked about this a number of times on on our podcast actually from the perspective of um, religious inclusion, LGBTQ, disability, et cetera, et cetera. It really makes such a difference to people. And essentially I think, you know, it means that you're, you don't have that kind of Sunday fear of going back to work the next day that you're looking forward to going back to work. There isn't that yeah. um, underlying discomfort, let's say, um, when you're at work. Yeah, and, and there's very varying opinions. I know, Helen, you and I have certainly spoken about this a few times in the last six months sort of that inclusion piece. And I've heard so many different variations to the acronym of DEI, Debbie, DEIB. Um, and I actually quite like when people refer to it as, as the female name as, as a Debbie, because how can you be included without the belonging? And I like the fact that the B is before the I in some occasions. Um, and it, 
that that's predominantly US centric clients that I've dealt with in the past 12 months that tend to speak around that acronym. But I think it is it is super important. Um, and I don't think you can belong unless you're included and there's equitable nature within the workplace and there's also diversity to go along with it. So I don't mind what way people jumble about that particular acronym. Um, and I think it is important. It will probably mask me on to the next question. I was going to touch on a few things that you mentioned there, Michelle, but I think the next question might answer them. So I won't touch on them in case you do. Um, maybe a little bit more. I'm going to ask you guys to go just a tiny bit deeper on, on the initial question um, and let the, the listeners and myself uh, know how have you gone about creating belonging in the workplace? And maybe if you could give one or two practical examples um, that people could take away and possibly try that, that you know have been proven to work in your spaces, which might not necessarily work in every space, but something that, that at least the listeners could take away with them. Um, and apologies, Sarah, but I'm going to go the same order again. I'm going to be completely okay. boring here. Um, yeah, no problem. Um, well, I think one of the things, and so just for some context, I typically tend to work in small to mid-sized businesses. Um, so I'm currently uh, working in an organization about 75 people. Um, and my approach here is generally we're in scaling businesses. So the dynamic in which we exist is fairly rapidly changing. And the reason I say that is oftentimes we're coming into an organization that doesn't necessarily have any foundation around how they want to go about this work. And so really the first thing that we step back and look at is asking, um, have, is there currently a sense of belonging? Um, and actually figuring out what is the, some of those kind of key primary drivers, because while sense of belonging is a unit is a universal feeling to Michelle's point, which was excellent. Like everybody needs it, how it shows up and what people look for in terms of how they want to have a sense of belonging is completely different. Um, depending on who you are, where you've come from, what your background looks like, even what part of the business you sit in a sense of belonging is going to be different for an engineer than it would be for someone in marketing. Um, and so, the things for me that I really think about quite a lot is really making decisions based on actual human people telling me what they need rather than assuming I know what they need. Um, and so some of the things that we've done there is regularly gathering data, regularly checking and asking that question, do you have a sense of belonging? Um, and looking at then what those other drivers are associated with that. For us, it's not enough to just ask if you belong. Like, sort of, as I said at the beginning, that there are actions that drive that sense of belonging, like being able to speak up without fear of retribution or seeing people get promoted from all areas of life and knowing that they can succeed at the company. Um, our perspectives like someone's being included in decision making. Um, and so we keep visiting, revisiting that on a fairly regular basis so that we know where, if we're, if we're lacking in a sense of belonging, that we need to really double down and drill in and really focus. And that works certainly not not easy especially with an organization if it's gone through an extensive period of change or um especially in the job market at the moment with a series of things like redundancies and layoffs happening like that sense of belonging gets really disrupted um and so trying to rebuild that but ultimately coming from that foundation of trust um and psychological safety at work is they're the kinds of really key things that we start talking about we have tools and stuff that i'll happily get into but i also don't want to talk for too long before handing it over and, and quick question Sarah how often do you tend to do sort of employee audits or, or employee surveys etc to gather that data yeah we do um every six months um okay. we have a, a standalone we thought about enrolling it into our engagement serving and we do demographic collection with that to make sure that we're doing what we say we're going to do as a diverse organization. Um, but specifically around the idea of belonging and inclusion, we uh, we have a, a six, like a twice yearly rhythm of um, checking in and making sure we ask those questions. That's in the formalized way, but it is part of all of our manager training. And, you know, as we think about one on ones and asking what people need to thrive, um, we check in on a much more informal basis much more frequently. Awesome. Thank you. I'll pass on to Michelle. Um, yeah, just I might just pick up the thread there because I think it's just it's so key in terms of that feedback mechanism, right? So yes, you can put a bunch of actions in place, but how do you know it's working if you don't have a really good feedback mechanism in place? Um, so maybe I'll sort of start there in terms of what we do uh, within Amazon. Um, one of the I suppose more peculiar things that we have is we actually have something um, called connections. 
and that what that is is every morning when you when you log in for the day you get a you get a question that pops up on your on your on your computer to answer and it, and some of those questions will link to um, an area around inclusion which includes belonging as an example they're also a pulse check on manager satisfaction job satisfaction tools and and productivity in the workplace as well so it's a full spectrum of different types of questions but it's a pulse check right but it links to what you were saying sarah there's no point putting in strategies and initiatives unless you're actually measuring the impact of those and course correcting where you need to so that's what that's what that that mechanism does for us at Amazon. It gives us uh, an idea of what's working, what's not working. We can dive down within each team or business area, get some of those themes, and then start looking at ways in which we may need to course correct or do something different. But in terms of um, you know some of the other things that we do at Amazon, we're continuing, to, continuing learning and innovating. And, and that example that I just gave is one of those. Um, but there's probably um, two ways that I think you know we're continuing to innovate and improve on the way that we create belonging in the workplace, which was a question, um, Chris. Uh, one of them, uh, and again, uh, uh, this may sound a little um, peculiar, but we have 16 leadership principles. We used to have 14. We added two in uh, in July 2021. Um, they're public, so go Google them. Go have a look. They're they're quite curious, and some you'll kind of go, "Wow, that doesn't really make any sense to me," but of those leadership principles, there's a few that actually really speak to the concept of inclusion and belonging. Um, from our original 14, there are things like our right a lot. Being our right a lot is not actually being right. It's actually seeking diverse perspectives so that you can either affirm or refute your initial idea, hypothesis or whatever. So being our right a lot as a leader is seeking diverse perspectives, very inclusive process. Other leadership principles, this one might sound a bit funny, have backbone, disagree and commit. Hmm, what's that about? It's about the fact that we want people to have an opinion. We want you to speak up and, and have a data-driven argument about why something doesn't make sense. We want you to disagree. But once we all agree on a particular course of action, if that wasn't your course of action that you, you wanted to see, you commit to it. We're all behind it. So it's a collective way that we can kind of come together and uh, take action forward. Hire and develop the best is another one of our leadership principles, very much speaking to diversity and inclusion and equity in terms of how we think about creating um, that sense of belonging, both in our hiring processes, as well as how we continue to attract and develop our employees. But the last one was one of the one of the two new ones that we added in July 2021, which I really think does speak to the concept of belonging, and that uh, leadership principle is strive to be Earth's best employer. And what that's that's really talking to is how we are as leaders creating a safer, a more productive, a high performing, a more diverse work environment, so that we're all actually creating that sense of belonging. So leadership principles is one of the way in which we both hire for individuals around our culture, but also how we continue to develop the way in which we perform um, for, our, for the work that we do for our customers. But the other way I gave you a little teaser in my intro was affinity groups. Now, affinity groups or employee resource groups, they're, they're called slightly different things in different organisations and they're not a new concept, but it is one of the ways in which that we uh, enable our employees to have a voice. So we have 13 globally, they have local chapters. Um, I'm really privileged to have set up the, the local chapter of women at Amazon for Australia and New Zealand about five years ago. Um, and what that means, what it meant for me to set that up was, was it was me actually taking a stand. It was saying, there are things that I either want to represent or ideas that I have, and I actually want to be able to do something about it. And I think that's what those affinity groups actually allow people to do, allow people to, to create the workplace that they want to see, allow our others to collaborate, and really strongly reinforce that feeling of belonging. Awesome. It's always nice to hear about what's changing at Amazon, um, especially as an ex-Amazonian. Um, and you mentioned the women at Amazon side, which for those who are listening is is predominantly where I was introduced to Michelle. Um, I used to host and chair some of the women at Amazon events, which as someone who falls into zero of the diversity categories, zero of the 
however many you can come up with, 15 plus. Um, I used to enjoy being an advocate for something that I'm not involved in because everyone else has to be involved as an advocate um, and a promoter of, of each diversity category, not just women for women. And Helen and I were in a, a rather data-driven, uh, heated debate on LinkedIn last night over these topics, and I loved it uh, because every other category should be forcing the change and, and moving the needle for each each individual category, not just the people that fall within those categories. So, yeah, um, I'll certainly look up the other, the new 16th leadership principle because I was very familiar with the 14. Um, you've just given me the 15th, and now I'm very eager to find out what the 16th is. So thank you. Um, I'll pass on to Helen the same question. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about this really from, I suppose, my own business perspective and, and what we've introduced as well as um, you know, some of the people that we partner with um, and, and that we speak to um, as businesses and, and on the podcast and so on. And just a few that popped up for me while, um, while the ladies were speaking were around what we've done with um, uh, an, an audit, a uh, diagnostic, if you like, which actually sits on our, our website, diversity.io. Um, which basically helps a business to understand where they are from a DNI perspective on the more cultural side of things. Um, so looking at things like strategies, policies, inclusion, belonging, all of that stuff. So if you want to check that out, it takes about six minutes and you get a report straight off the back of it to get a sense of where you are as a business. Um, some of the things that we implemented off the back of that were religious and public holiday choices. Um, so to give you a very kind of clear example, we had um, a Muslim gentleman who worked for us last year. Um, he was not particularly religious. Um, he certainly um, wasn't especially interested in, in celebrating Christmas as such or even um, Eid or Ramadan. Uh, but he did have his own way of appreciating religion and spirituality. And he preferred to take different days um, for his religious holidays. So we gave him the choice of, you know, not taking those um, slated days, let's say in the UK calendar where he was based, but actually those that were more relevant to him. And um, I know it certainly made a difference to, to, to his motivation um, as an employee. And he really felt um, grateful for that. He hadn't seen that in, in other organizations. Um, flexible working hours and locations is a really obvious one. I mean, for us, we're all remote, so that's fairly fairly simple and easy, but I think helps people to feel um, that they're heard and listened to and given those options around how and where they work. So it's not completely straightjacketed. You're not put into a particular bucket um, and you can do your work just as well as, as anybody else. Um, something that we do on a fairly regular basis are things like personality tests and quizzes. So because we're all remote for businesses that are remote uh, and many businesses are um, increasingly remote these days, it really helps to get a sense of belonging to the team um, to help people to understand who you are away from the workplace, who you are as a person that you probably would do a little better if you worked in an office. Together, we even do things like, um, uh, you know, looking at the type of personality you are from a neurodiversity perspective, which is always very interesting and obviously isn't um, completely obvious, even when you do know somebody quite well. Um, I speak to people on the podcast all the time about um, different ways of creating inclusion and belonging. Something that came up quite recently um, with a gentleman who works at the University of Cambridge who studies inclusion um, in the physical space is around how to make people feel <clears throat> that they belong to that space. So creating quiet zones for those um, who prefer quiet zones or have a neurodivergent tendency towards them. Um, looking at office layouts and accessibility is a really obvious one even things like breastfeeding rooms i don't know if you know bigger companies like amazon provide these but certainly they make a huge difference and places yeah. to store breast milk if um, returning mothers are, are coming back to the workplace all of these things just make people feel that they belong that they feel connected that they feel listened to and heard um, and, and makes their working life easier so they can just get on with the job that they're that they're there to do Awesome. Uh, so some very important points, and I'm going to link two of them here between Sarah and Helen. You mentioned flexible working policies, Helen. Uh, my newsletter, I can't remember whether it was last week or the week before, I actually spoke exactly about this. And even having flexibility within the flexibility is important. A lot of organizations try to, 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 to surface layer a flexible working policy, presuming that it will be perfect for every single department. And Sarah mentioned earlier that finance isn't the same as marketing. Marketing isn't the same as X. And that's the same with flexible working policies. I've seen and I've been under the hood of so many organizations 
even just in my own time of having my own advisory business, which is only 12 months, um, and organizations try to put a blanket across everything without without remembering that uh, a front office worker or an office manager or a receptionist is going to have a completely different flexibility within their own working right to that of a developer, to that of a salesperson who's in the field who has to be in front of customers, to that of, and that could go, I could go on forever about that, but it's, it is an important point about the flexible working. I'm still yet to speak to anyone since COVID started, let alone ended, who will accept a role that doesn't have some flexibility around the working. Um, and, and that's a completely changed world that it's now strange to think of being in an office five days a week. If you'd have asked me this three years ago before COVID, I would have said, no, no one's going to do that anytime soon. But it's amazing just how much that changes and how quickly those changes have been enforced. And you're right, you have to flex, you have to be adaptable. Um, and, and Michelle would know this. You mentioned you don't know about the bigger organizations. When I was at Amazon, they had breastfeeding rooms, they had prayer rooms. Mm -hmm. And in order to be just a tiny bit more, perhaps, inclusive than some other organizations who didn't provide that service. It also helps when you've got multiple floors as your offices to have that space. But it's always, I think it's always a positive, even in the smallest offices, that there's a, a tiny little side room as a reading room or a prayer room or a breastfeeding room or a whatever. Um, so, yeah, very good points brought up. Um I'm going to maybe ask something from both ends. And the original question was, how can we go about creating belonging at every level of a business? Um, and I might ask for both ends of the spectrum here. Um, how do you go about creating it at the very um, entry level within an organization? And how does that compare to the most senior end of an organization? I might not ask for every level. I might just ask for both ends of the, I guess, the hierarchical structure. Sorry to use hier hierarchy as I hate it, but... Um, the, I'm, I'm going to throw that to the to the group, if that's okay. And I'll go same again. Sarah, Michelle, <laughs> Helen. <laughs> I mean, it looks different, but it looks the same, honestly. Like, because everybody's needs are different. Um, one of the things that we actually use as a tool um, at every level of the organization is what we call a user manual. It's like our own user manual for who we are and how we like to work. But not just how we like to work, like, what is it you what is it you want to get out of work how do you feel like how do you want to have connection with your team members like how do you prefer to receive feedback are you a camera off or camera on person like everything that we um that we have to you know that as we interact with each other every day and the facets of our personality we have user manuals to help um other people understand how to get the best out of us and vice versa and that happens from the ceo down to the most entry level um data entry person um and they are kind of like they operate as like our truly is like our, our foundational kind of cornerstone of how we how we interact with one another. Um, the other thing I think is really important when we cover uncover belonging is that more junior levels definitely take their cues from a more senior hierarchical place. So leading with things like vulnerability. Uh, transparency and truly being able to relate to that person that sits at the very top of the organization um, and be able to see them as a person and not just a CEO or a COO or your VP of your department, but actually as a whole person in itself can really help um, foster that sense of belonging throughout the rest of the organization just by being the person that you that you are. And then the other way I would say, the other thing that we talk about a lot is through storytelling. Um, everybody plays this part. They're, they're, they're more than just a cog in the machine. They have a purpose as to why they came to choose to come and work for your organization in the first place. For us, our whole mission is to eliminate underemployment. Um, and that is the reason a lot of people come through our doors, but they stay um, because they can see that they're making an impact on that meet, on that mission itself. Um, and that sense in a sense of driving that belonging, but we have to keep telling that story. We have to keep talking about how that plays a part into this big thing that we're striving to do and building empathy between teams as to how this is just as important as this. Finance paying the bills is just as important as the engineers building the platform on which our company runs. Um, and that continued, that continued storytelling, but that's also different depending on the level of the organization and, and how you're truly catering to the group of people that you're that you're talking with, which comes right back to the beginning in terms of ask what people need um, and you'll have a much easier time building a sense of belonging because you'll be able to give it to them. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. 
I think for me, it's it's an interesting question to answer because the way that I'm, I think about it, I think there are things, so totally agree with you, Sarah, there are things, so, so leadership support is paramount. There are, and there are um, elements of this that need to be almost like top down. Obviously, the, it's the, the, the walking, the talking the walk and walking the talk and all of that sort of thing. Um, and some of it can be really simple things. So as an example, a couple of years ago, um, we, we, and it's not an original idea, but we came up with a pledge as a leadership team around 40, 40, 20, that we could then apply to everything that we did. So, so that anything internal or external events, we wanted to have 40% women, 40% men, and 20% and would be binary or other. And so um, very, very simple and not an original concept, but by us taking a pledge and then actually kind of cascading that and then thinking about what that meant if we did an employee, like an all hands, did we, were we meeting that pledge? If we were putting uh, people on stage at uh, one of our big customer events, were we meeting that pledge? If I get asked to be, speak on a panel and I realise I've sort of not not done too bad today, but but there have been panels that I've I've challenged and said, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be the only woman on the panel with five other men. That is not balance. That is not what we stand for. So really simple things like that that I think can really be led from the top, led by example, but almost kind of not mandated, but this is what we stand for. But equally, when we think about it at all levels, I mean, Chris, you, you talked about obviously people who are just starting their professional career journey. Um, at different levels, I kind of see there's an element of cohorts need to get together to feel that sense of belonging. So I'll give you an example. We have each year... We have a number of new graduates that join our business across different roles. So they might join, uh, for example, in my team as a business analyst or a sales operations analyst. They might join in our business development team. They might join in our tech team as a, a what we call tech university. So as a junior um, solutions architect, an associate solutions architect. Um, so they've all got different roles. They've all got a team that they belong to, different functional teams, but we've but we've really brought them together as an overall graduate cohort because they're all experiencing that first year out of university and learning how to actually operate in a corporate. So I think there's there's teams and there's also cohorts that you'll bring together and and to a certain extent that's what our affinity groups do as well they bring people together with like interests i could be an ally of like one of our other and i am one of our other affinity groups glamazon representing our lgbtq plus employees and their allies you know it is it's a it's a little bit of an amorphous um kind of move that you move between your team where you belong other like cohorts like you, which might be from a functional or other perspective, but equally other employee groups that you can gravitate towards. And I think that's re what really helps with the sense of belonging at all levels. Some of it comes top down in terms of here's what we stand for, but some of it comes within teams and across teams to really create that strong sense of belonging. We overarchingly reinforce it through our culture, as you would know, Chris, that is pervasive yeah. across all of our different types of businesses. So if you're working in a fulfillment centre in Amazon or you're working in our support engineering area or you're working in sales, we are all hired the same way. We are Our performance is measured the same way. We all think the same way, which is really around our culture and our leadership principles. That's what helps us create our sense of belonging across functions and, and through all of those levels. Um, so, it's, so it's complex. I think there's not one right answer. Um, there's multiple different ways in which we look at it. Yeah, and, and it's an important factor. I actually think, and this might be selfish of me, um, I, I, I notice more um, in the past sort of five years, but specifically in the last few years, that I actually think the graduate cohort teach leadership a lot about what it is to be inclusive and what it is to be belonging because they come in with a completely new mindset and set of skills that are all centred around everyone being equal. And they've been through school and university where there are where it's okay to be part of LGBTQ, mm -hmm. okay to be X, Y, and Z, more than it perhaps was when I was a graduate um, or when yeah. I was just going through uni and getting into my first job. And I think the graduate cohort show that the needle is moving way more than the most senior people in an organization. And no offense to anyone here, because there's a lot of senior people on this panel, including me, 
Uh, but but that's just, again my my opinion there is that mm -hmm. I think the junior the, the more junior cohort in the workforce are actually teaching the more senior cohort almost how things should have been done for the past fifty years, but it's only been five Good or time. ten. Could not agree with you more. I, my second daughter Very has just it. started university, and she, the way that she talks, she, she, like this isn't this isn't a topic to discuss because it's just seen <laughs> as that's it's how they is. operate. So yep. Couldn't agree with you more, Chris. We have a lot to learn from the generations of the future. Absolutely, and I do. Every, I'm a sponge every day to people that will be my boss in probably five years, as opposed mm -hmm. to the usual twenty, because they're way more intelligent than most people in the room. Sorry, Helen. I'll I'll pass it over to you as well. <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't have a huge amount to add. I think we've we've talked a lot about different structures that you can put in place, the ERGs, psychological safety, um, you know, those types of things, obviously asking questions, feedback loops. Um, and I completely agree. I think that around this question, there just needs to be a sense of fluidity. There needs to be a sense of being a good human being um that to me is is how this works and modeling that within the workplace so whether you're a senior person or as you say a graduate and i totally agree on your points around young people i have three very young people in my house eight and under um and even they sometimes teach me on a daily basis about inclusivity um and what they learn at school um and you know they, they go to a, a school here that um, again, spoken to a, a lady on the podcast about it's not very long ago, um, that is truly inclusive and that has very high academic levels and includes those with disabilities, neurodiversity um, within the classroom. And that is just part and parcel of their of their day to day. And I see it change the way that they um, look at those with differences. Um, so that being schooled essentially is going to change the workplace in the future. And that needs to be kind of open and listened to. The other thing I, I would add here is just that there are tools out there to help you to get this right. Um, we work with a few. Inclusivity, I would mention, as one that is, is a good one to look up. Um, Pulsify, Real Links, M Border. You know, there is tech out there to help you um, to get this right from a DIB perspective. So it's worth checking it out um, if you want to know how to get started. Yeah, and I agree with those points as well, as well, especially when you said that your kids um, look at people a certain way. I would actually say they probably don't look at people a certain way, whereas we were brought up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And they don't look at anyone as being different, regardless of what they're doing or what background they're from, etc. And, and that's where I think the younger cohort in the globe, which I'm unfortunately not one of, um, are certainly making that, moodle, that, that needle move a lot more than, than a lot of the older generations and more senior generations have done. Um, I'm maybe going to bundle the last two questions together. Um, I'm conscious that we've only got a few minutes before we want to try and open up um, Q&A. Um, if everyone can maybe give me what is or what has been the biggest challenge that you've seen or that you've been a part of with regards to creating belonging in, in a workplace. I won't ask for many examples here from each, just one. Um, and then a closing question of if you could give one thing to take away for the audience to perhaps try to take back into the workplace or try to implement, what would that be? Um, challenge wise, I definitely have seen great intention and poor delivery and poor follow through. And that really does come down to the tone has to be set from the top. Um, otherwise you're just pushing a boulder up a hill and it, it just loses any sense of integrity and trust. Um, if you're not prepared to, to listen to the feedback, if you're asking people how they feel and how they belong and, and what, how they see the world and you're not prepared to actually do anything with that information, it's just, there's a ton of love lost there. That's where I've really yeah. seen it to be challenging. Um, but as I think it's to Michelle's point, there's so much data out there saying why this is so important. Like if you're someone, if there's one thing to take away and you're worried about not knowing how to do it or not being able to put it together in a way that a business is going to resonate with it, come at it from a place of facts, like happy people at work that feel a sense of strong self and belonging are they they outperform their peers those businesses outperform those business other businesses in the competitive landscape um and it really does drive healthy businesses that that can thrive um that would be where i would start um and then the other one would be find some allies in your network um find some other like-minded companies perhaps in your local geography or not even with this being a 
<laughs> like everywhere at the moment. Um, but learn from other people and see what's worked for them. And you, you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. There's a lot of really cool stuff that's already been done. It doesn't have to be new and shiny. It can be taking something that someone else has done and repurposing it to fit how you need it to work. Um, so yeah, that would be my takeaway. Make connections and come at it from a place of data. It's a very good point on the data side. A lot of boardrooms that I've dealt with in that sort of space that you're in, Sarah, the sort of startup scale up space over the past 12 months are almost petrified to see the data because they don't want to admit that they're doing things completely wrong. But I, I always go back with, look, until you see the data, you won't make any changes to the to the parts that need changing. It's, so um, true. it's also underpinned with the fear of, oh my gosh, it's going to cost us so much money. Yeah. Like, because we're not an Amazon or a Microsoft or, a, you know, a giant company that can really truly invest in um, strong infrastructure and, and accommodations that, you know, a, a small scaling startup can't do, but it doesn't have to cost any money um, yeah. because it's the intention that matters and it's the follow through that matters and it's creating a safe space is completely free. Um, all of those other things are completely fantastic, but there's lots of ways of being able to respond to what your workforce needs without it having to be an expensive endeavor. Yeah. And if you reverse that, if you reverse engineer that onto the attraction side, a lot of organizations, when I speak to them about employer and talent branding or EVP, they're so scared to put out into the market because they haven't done anything yet. And I said, look, it's equally as much of a positive for the external market to hear. We have figured out we're doing these five things wrong and here's what we're doing to try and change it. So, so, so reinforce that you're trying to change the attraction that that will bring from a talent, from a partner, from a, a client, a customer perspective is huge. Um, and then all you have to do is replicate that honesty and transparency into your EVP internally to your organization. And I, like a lot of companies say to me, but I can't put that out because we haven't done it yet. But put out the intention. And as long as you follow through with it, it will be very well received. People are so scared of the unknown. And like, I, I'm one of those people to a certain extent, but yeah. Um, Great points. Michelle, I'll pass it on to you. Uh, yeah, so I think on the on the challenges, certainly the last couple of years has not been easy in terms of how do you create a sense of belonging in a virtual world <laughs> when we all were virtual? How do you actually get to know each other? I took on my current role um, taking in, in lockdown with a team, the majority of whom I had never met face to face. Um, the good news is that over that period of time, we've we've learned so much, right? We've learned to be resilient, but we've also got a bunch of tools now in our kit bag, tools and techniques that we didn't actually have to exercise before because we never had to engage with the teams the same way that we do do what we have done and continue to do in so many different ways in terms of a hybrid way of engagement. So it's been challenging, but we've got a bunch of tools that we can now actually work differently. So whether that's um, uh, we've done like uh, coffee roulette, so broad teams, spin the wheel, who's going to have coffee with who? Really easy way to meet someone. Um, so just really simple things that if we hadn't had the last couple of years, we probably wouldn't have discovered all of these great ways that we could engage over a little tiny square on our laptop with our camera. <laughs> um, in terms of the takeaway, I kind of would just link back to something that Sarah said. I, I think this, the, and, and you touched on it too a little bit, Chris, too, in terms of, you know, not thinking about that this has to be a massive statement and a strategy on here's how we're going to create belonging. Um, actually let it come from, from within the organisation. I continually am amazed by the ideas that our employees come up with in terms of what they are thinking of that is actually going to move the needle for them in terms of how they feel included or initiatives or how we can grow our talent. And so you don't have to have all of the answers, but what you do need to do is be able to create the safe space or the platform to allow those voices to be heard in terms of what could be done differently. The ideas are there, we just need to create the space to, to let them be heard. So think about how you do that, whether that is, um, we talked about the levels and different types of groups in an organisation before. We've been doing listening sessions run by our area managing director all different types of, of roles and levels within the organization, but it's a great way to actually hear those voices and what we can do differently. Awesome. Thanks, Michelle. Helen, I'll pass on the same. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, in terms of challenges, I'd say uh, what I've always found is it, it can be very difficult to get 
um, everybody involved, everybody on the same page, you know, encourage inquire to people, um, those who are less inclined to jump up and, you know, put their hand up first. Um, I was probably one of those when I was working in big corporates. I didn't really want to be part of every single group going, you know, I just kind of in, in most days, I just wanted to go in there, get my work done and, you know, leave once once I'd achieved what I wanted to achieve. Um, so I think it, you know, you can't expect everybody to toe the line on this stuff. I think belonging is, um, you've got to want to be a part of the organization. You've got to want this to work as an individual and you can't force people into those boxes. Um, so that is always a challenge, particularly for, for large organizations, I think. Um, in terms of one takeaway, I would say, just to go back really to, to the data and data isn't always about uh, quantitative numbers. I mean, it's certainly how we work at Diversely, looking at six different elements of, of diversity and, and getting the hard numbers on where a business is, where it should be and, and how it's getting there. But I think where belonging is concerned, there is a lot of qualitative data that can also be collected. As I mentioned, um, we have a diagnostic tool on, on our website that helps businesses to do that. Um, and that's equally important because it helps get a temperature check. It helps get that, that feedback. Um, it helps to open up discussions about this. And I think to your point, Chris, about around being open about this stuff, I've spoken to businesses recently that are incredibly closed around the data that they hold, that they collect, um, and they won't even discuss it with, with their inter internal employees, let alone make it public. And I would absolutely argue that making it public is vital. You know, take your employees on this journey take your leadership on this journey, take um, the public and, and the clients that you serve on this journey as well to show willing, to show that you're actually moving in the right direction and you have the intention of, of improving wherever you happen to start from. Um, you know, there are always ways to improve. And I think we've touched on a number of those in this in this conversation this morning. Awesome. Um, thank you very much to the three of you for, for all of your points. Um, I think we'll probably invite Christina uh, back on if she's if she's going to to pop back on so that we can we can grab some of the Q and A questions and and hopefully get them answered as quickly and sufficiently as possible. Uh, Perfect, first yeah, one. So the first one's from Andrea. Yeah, lo lovely, Andrea Kirby. Um, welcome, Andrea. I didn't even realise that you were on. Um, so Andrea said that she saw a statistic that sixty percent of the workforce in the UK are unable to work remotely and it's a huge discussion but it is a big bit of the workforce that doesn't have the opportunity how do we account for them so we might open that up a little bit broader um, just because we've got sort of michelle here um helen dubai um and sarah in in canada um and just maybe ask how does that affect the regions that you operate in or that you manage um or that you look after um and how do you account for um I guess, remote working in the workforce? I mean, so, so from, from my perspective, I think that the, we see the value of bringing employees back into the office. But for certain, for certain tasks, we know that we innovate better, we ideate better when you've actually got human face-to-face -face interaction. But there's other things that we do, like if I've got um, a big uh, kind of document to write, I'm, you know, I I need some thinking time. I need I need quiet time, and sometimes that's best for me to do in the comfort of my own home. So what what I see is very much this hybrid shift in terms of how how do we make it, how is it equitable, I suppose, for people who can or can't re work remotely. That I think the last couple of years has helped us a little bit with that. We've seen how we can quickly pivot to remote, but now we need to get a little bit more used to how do we blend the two effectively. And it's still challenging, right? So if you've got a meeting uh, and you've got some, I've got my team all over Australia and New Zealand, and so I'm, I'm still going to be working in a hybrid environment from the perspective that I've got people who are not going to be, going to be in the room, but I want their voices heard. And so we continue to experiment with different ways in which we do that. And, and rotate. so that might be rotating the voice. Um, it might be rotating the, the host. Um, so I think we just continue to experiment and it's and it, but it's not easy. And so I think it's a trying a bunch of things that actually work for the group of individuals that you're representing. Awesome. Thanks, Michelle. Helen or 
Sarah? I mean, everything Michelle said, to be honest, it's about deliberating. <laughs> it's about being deliberate in how you choose to connect with groups of people, holding space for people if they're not in the room and vice versa, really thinking about the experiences you're able to provide for the individuals if you're working in a hybrid environment. Um, we are also spread all over uh, North America. And so one of the things that we have is for those individuals that do want to work in person, we've got two key geographies in Canada, one in Vancouver, one in Toronto. And we have a uh, flexi space that they can go and use if they want to work in person, because I'm not anyone to decide how someone works best. If they want to be in there in a 500 square foot apartment with three children and they want to go to an office, I would like to provide that for them so they can do their best work. But if there's someone that wants to stay at home and never, then they can also completely do that. Um, but what we try and do then is we, we do in person things in those geographies, but we always, always make sure that we have something is equally great for everybody to participate in remotely as well. So that we're really thinking about customizing those experiences as much as we possibly can to include as many of the people that want to be involved as we possibly can. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, nothing, nothing uh, major to add from my side. I think I, I, I don't, I don't really understand this stat. I don't really understand the context behind it. Um, I'm not sure what that means, unable to work remotely. Um, but I, I guess it's on the onus of the of the employer, um, you know, as 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 we've all said, to make this as possible as it can be uh, for people to join your organization. Not every organization can offer remote work. There are obviously some very clear, um, very clear roles that, that, that just can't be done remotely. Um, but I think giving people that that option and giving them the flexibility is really what's key, putting the choice in their hands. And if you are a person that simply cannot work remotely for, for whatever reason, um, then it will be more important to you to look for a role in an organization that offers you an in-office opportunity. But yeah, I'm not quite sure what, what where, the, where this stat has come from. I've not seen this one. So um, Yeah, I'll I think I'll definitely ping Andrea after this to ask where the stat came yeah. from. <laughs> that, that was going to be my question. Why wouldn't you have the availability to do it unless you're with an organization as all of you have said that force people back into the office which could be the case and that could be where the start has come from um i'm a data-driven person i love start so i'll definitely ask andrea after this um, <laughs> where the start came from and i'll feed it back to to everyone um any others in terms of questions yep Jessica Mitchell. So Jessica said, um, how to create belonging for young LGBTQIA plus people who are less likely to be out in the workplace? And I'm guessing by out here, she's meaning I have actually come out as being uh, whatever mm. part of LGBTQ they are. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll pass it on to whoever wants to answer here. I'm not going to do the usual rotation that I've been doing for 40 minutes. I actually had a conversation with somebody a couple of weeks ago about this, um, who's who's 30 now, but who um, originally was born in Switzerland, raised in Switzerland, was not um, in a position where he felt comfortable being out, you know, didn't come out to, to his parents until he was in his late teens, moved to London for that very specific reason, and then was incredibly shocked to go into a workplace where he still could not be himself and, and could not fully um you know talk about his um his his belonging to the lgbtq plus community uh he also has a friend who's been in the workplace at the same job for 16 years and his colleagues still don't know so this is a huge thing and i and i don't know if it's specific to young people um i would say these days um, a lot of young people do feel more comfortable kind of being themselves whether it's online you know and, and everything else that goes around that um, so there is a lot more opportunity for people to be themselves in the workplace, certainly than there was when I started out um, in my career. But, you know, I think it's really about giving them those spaces that they can join quietly if they want to. So I think we mentioned ERGs or um, somebody called them something else. I can't remember uh, in, in the conversation. So giving people that that space to be safe um, and to join and to kind of show up. Um, and to be part of that if if they wish to. We also um, had a conversation recently with a gentleman called Elliot Higgins. Um, and uh, Elliot is, um, he, you know, he works for NatWest um, and he basically said that, you know, they are given the option to wear a lanyard that has them either in female, dress or male dress, depending on how they feel at 
on that particular day. And again, that just gives people an opportunity along with things like pronouns to be who they are, um, whatever that might be on, on that particular day to them. So I think there's lots of opportunity to, um, you know, to give people that space um, without having to ask them directly uh, to be to be who they are in the workplace. I yeah, think, I, I, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Sarah. <laughs> I think for us, yes, completely agree. Um, those are all absolutely exceptional points. Um, we also want to make sure that from the outset, even through discovery of a brand as a potential employer, that we're talking about what it is to be a safe space and a safe employer for someone that's potentially looking to really make sure they can feel at home if they are in the LGBTQ plus community. Um, so talking about it openly on your career site, um, making sure you're encouraging and you've got language in your application that shows that you are friendly, a, a friendly employer. Um, we went as far as being, I don't know if they have this anywhere else, but in Canada, we have the Re Rainbow Register Program, which is um, an audit that you actually go through to show that you are an LGBTQ plus friendly employer and you get a little badge. And like it's one of those things that really makes a difference because it's so welcoming right from the get go that it becomes less of a question mark as to can I be myself here to I actually want to go and apply to this company because I know I can be myself here. Perfect, because uh, you've just taken all of the points that I was going to say. So let me try and wrap that up then. Um, so totally on employee resource groups, and I think that that's what we've tried to create with our affinity groups. I mentioned Glamazon, which is representing our LGBTQ plus um, employees and their allies. Um, so creating that sense of belonging, creating that safe space that 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 people feel like that they can, um, you know, get support when they need it to Sarah's point in terms of the attraction into the organisation is hugely important. I was actually speaking to a colleague just, just last week who said that was exactly what I looked for when I was interviewing. I looked for the rainbow signs. Um, that was really important to me. And then the last point that I'll add, because I've got to have something a little bit different, is, is the role modelling and the storytelling. The more people that talk about their journey, again, I was at an event a couple of weeks ago um, for someone that, that talked about their journey of coming out in the workplace and the people that were instrumental allies as well as other role models from the LGBTQ plus community was hugely instrumental in how they felt safe in coming out in the work in the workplace that they were in, but then also knowing that they would be supported in the way that they continued to operate. So I think role modeling and storytelling would be the thing that I would add to those other two elements. Awesome. I also noticed storytelling was mentioned in the comments. I'm pretty sure it was by the same person, by Jessica. Um, so yeah. Um, and I'm I'm sure that this is a storytelling question that's just about to come up. Um, so one common topic that Jessica noticed throughout the Public se Sector LGBTQIA Leadership and Allyship Summit and Human Rights Conference is the focus on storytelling and creating safe workplaces um, or safe places in general, not just workplaces. Um, I'm not so sure if that's a question, but more of a- Not a uh, question, uh, more of a comment. It, it, seemed, yeah. it seemed um, relevant, yeah, so I thought Definitely I'd Definitely relevant to, to what's just been discussed. I know that we are right about on time, so um, I, I probably won't say too much more other than a, a huge, huge thank you especially given the time of day it is for a few of the panel members. I know Michelle and I have got it pretty easy at two in the afternoon, but thank you so much to Sarah and to Michelle and to Helen. Um, I'll let Christina wrap it up um, and, and hopefully everyone had something to at least take away from the discussion. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chris, and our awesome panellists. And thank you, everyone, for attending today. Um, this recording and the follow-up material will be available in the Striving platform tomorrow. And have a great afternoon, everyone. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.